Quick disclaimer on this video, I got a bit of a cold, so I'm sorry if I sound hoarse or a bit stuffy. Hopefully I'll be back to normal soon. Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where OP screws his lying boss out of $100,000. Our next Reddit post is from Deleted. This happened in the early 2000s when I joined a startup. We agreed on a salary and no paid overtime, and an evaluation in three months, and then more evaluations annually. Standard stuff, mostly. It was a very mediocre salary for the work, but I really liked the work itself, which was extremely interesting and challenging. For me, even if the finances were so-so, I felt that I'd learned a lot of skills which would be useful in the future. After three years and having 10 decent clients and a bunch of clients trailing and money rolling in, the talk turned to back pay and paid overtime plus compensation for past overtime. At that point, I had accrued $50,000 in overtime, which is a lot. Legally, it wasn't allowed to be back pay, so there was talk of a discretionary bonus instead. Now, at this point, everyone's okay with this, myself included. And this was discussed in writing, via company emails too, so I felt secure that there was no bad will at play. I felt the company should be able to afford the payment. Also, I'd happily settle for getting company equity at a discount if cash flow was an issue. The discussions about back pay and possible equity had started to drag on, and I was getting irked by this. In the end, they offered me company equity, which wasn't even close to the value of the overtime that I worked. Their offer was an FU to stiff me out of money, and I did not want to take that laying down. To say that I was furious was an understatement. Anyway, the day that my boss made that offer, I handed in my resignation. This sent the chief technology officer into panic mode because the CEO had refused an updated contract and I was still on a one month notice period. Plus, I had a lot of untaken paid leave. Basically, it meant that I was walking out right then and there. So off I went that very same day, to the shock and surprise of everyone, I guess. The next day, I sent an official registered letter requesting my overtime and back pay and received a negative response, which I followed up with another detailed demand. This was also rejected because the bonus was discretionary and there was no overtime. However, I'd been seeking legal advice and I understood that they didn't have a leg to stand on if I'm willing to pay for an attorney. And since liability in these matters is firmly 100% on the employer, I was willing to pay for an attorney. You need to understand that going to a lawyer was very rare in those parts back then. So companies generally didn't expect this outcome. When going through the applicable laws with the attorney, I noticed there was a limitation of seven years. So while my attorney was laying out what to do in order to get me my money in as little as a few weeks, I just asked him, what if we wait until it's six years and 11 months after the transgression and then file demanding interest as well? I wanted to take this action because the law stated that back pay was due at 9% above the base rate of 3.25% at the time, accrued daily for every day past the due date. We're looking at 12% compound daily interest. The risk is that the company folds in that time, but I decided to take that risk. I sent one final letter stating that I expect all the owed and accrued amounts to date to be paid immediately, and of course, nothing happened. For the next few years, life rolled on. The company did grow and become a known player in the area. When the time came, I found an attorney and started the case. We had copies of all the communications, copies of the registered letters, and responses. At this point, including interest, my back pay that I was demanding was $112,000. What I didn't know is that in addition to this, there are also fixed penalties for each instruction to perform uncompensated overtime. The total demand was something like $135,000. To say that the CEO lost his mind would be an understatement. I got a very verbally abusive phone call, which I dutifully recorded. And I added that to the filing too. The CEO fought it, or tried to, but when the judge heard the phone call, he immediately took a dim view of the CEO. Reading through all the communication just put more nails in the defense's coffin. The judge ruled in my favor and instructed the company to pay immediately and without delay. And he also ordered the company to pay all of my legal costs. They also got a full audit from the Department of Labor. The company paid up a week later. 
To add insult to injury, the evening of the court's decision, the CEO apparently got very drunk and crashed his car into another vehicle while drunk. He got a DUI conviction and lost his driving license for a year and a half, and his insurance refused to pay out for the damages to his vehicle, a brand new Mercedes S-Class, because he was drunk. All in all, it was a glorious day. We've all heard that phrase, revenge is a dish best served cold, and Growing up, I always kind of thought about that phrase because it can be interpreted two ways and I never really understood which way it's supposed to be interpreted. One interpretation is cold as in like ruthless, cruel, mean, without any empathy or mercy, just utterly brutal. And like, I think that's how most people interpret that phrase. But I always have to wonder, did that person originally mean revenge is a dish best served cold as in patiently, right? Because if you cook a dish and you wait a while, then the dish will become cold. So is the person who came up with that trying to say that you have to create your revenge and be patient and wait for the time to strike and then deliver your revenge, which by then will be cold? And like, yeah, that's probably not the intended meaning of the phrase, but OP definitely captured that meaning in this story. Waiting seven years to get his revenge, which will more than double the payout, is genius. Our next Reddit post is from For The Win. Our office had a rotation of eight receptionists, two of which were full-time and the rest of us worked part-time shifts. We had varied hours, but were open seven days a week, ranging from the standard nine to five to nine to nine certain days of the week. Depending on the day, we had up to two people working at reception. It was a medical office, so if we were given any type of paperwork, it needed to be scanned into our system the same day for insurance purposes. Now, my slacking coworker, Marilyn, all but refused to scan anything in and waited for whoever was relieving her to pass off the paperwork to them. Honestly, this was dangerous. There were certain patients that could have been diagnosed with brain tumors, and her not doing her job would delay their diagnosis. Me and five of my coworkers spoke to her privately about that matter, stating that we would go to our boss if Marilyn didn't change. She said that she would start scanning everything in from then on. That lasted for about two weeks before she slacked off and stopped doing her job again. Eventually, three of the five of us went to our boss about it. We all explained the situation to her, that our workloads were doubling because of Marilyn's refusal to do work, that we felt it was unfair, that we felt incredibly stressed out as a result. Our boss assured us that it would be handled and told us not to worry. Another thing to note about the office, it was basically like being in high school again. It was mostly women working, most of whom were in their 30s and 40s, but acted like teenagers. There was a lot of gossiping and a lot of passive-aggressive behavior. Like, if someone wanted to order lunch, they would purposefully not tell one person or a group of people because she was mad at that person that day. It was just weird and childish, and I was lucky not to get caught in the crossfire, until the day that I told my boss. You see, we left our boss's door open as we were explaining the situation. Unfortunately, that meant that the billing department, which consisted of three people who were all busybodies, could hear everything because they were right next door. One of them was quick to call up Marilyn and let her know what we had done. Marilyn was called into her boss's office later that day, and when she returned, she looked livid. She immediately went to the administrative staff and told them all what happened, claiming that the part-timers had some kind of personal vendetta against her for no reason, and how she was a victim in all of this. She then made it her personal mission to try to make our work lives miserable, which included encouraging the rest of the staff to not speak with us. That didn't work for the most part, but there was definitely a lot of coldness from a few people on the administrative staff. Taking 30 minute bathroom breaks when she worked with one of us and just disappearing altogether if a rush of people walked in. She refused to physically speak to us. Instead, she would send us an email if she had a request. Can you please stop swallowing your water so loudly while we were sitting right next to each other? Making sure that we never got invited to lunch orders, happy hours, dinner parties, etc taking any mementos that we had posted on the walls and replacing them with pictures of her kids, constantly printing and doing things for her personal life. But if she caught one of us doing the same thing, she would immediately tell the administrative staff. If anything, this brought the five of us closer together. We wouldn't have gone to the work happy hour anyway since we were all hanging out together elsewhere. 
We all had our frustrating Maryland stories, but we had also worked part-time and in varying degrees of finishing schooling, so it didn't really matter what she pulled. We were all careful to document what we could as well. Any particularly nasty emails were forwarded to our personal accounts, and we had a running log of breaks that she took, etc. However, Marilyn somehow convinced the administrative staff to shorten all of our hours. I went from 20 hours a week to 10. The two other people who had gone to the boss were in similar boats, while the ones who had been frustrated with Marilyn but unable to make the meeting suddenly had their workloads doubled. We were all angry at this point because no one wanted the hours they were receiving. On top of that, the yearly raise I was supposed to receive hadn't been implemented due to my poor work performance, which again is BS. Once again, we went to our boss, this time all five of us. Instead of listening to us, looking at all of our evidence that we had against Marilyn and letting us explain how toxic of a work environment it had become, she completely blew us off and told us that either we do our work or find somewhere else to be employed. Later on that week, I overheard the boss talking to a girl in the billing department about how Marilyn was going to come over to the boss's house that weekend and cut her hair for free. The 180 in my boss's attitude suddenly made sense. Following the meeting with my boss, my coworkers and I had a little gathering. I had been planning on quitting the job soon anyway because I was starting graduate school. Of my four other coworkers, two were going back to nursing school, one had found a full-time job elsewhere, and the other was just sick of all the BS. We all played it cool for about a week, and then, one by one, handed in our letters of resignation. We all said that we were quitting on the exact same date. Also, another receptionist decided she was going back to school, so she quit as well. From eight receptionists, our office was now down to two. Only two receptionists had the ability to work past 5 p.m., and they both quit. So, no more late-night appointments. I was the only receptionist who worked on Sundays, so I guess they can't be open seven days a week anymore. Our boss practically begged three of us to change our minds, or at least change the date of our resignation so she could have more time to find replacements. No dice. By my estimate, by the time they manage to find and train all the people they need, they will have lost at least $50,000. Instead of having a party on the day that we quit, as expected, the entire administration staff was too busy trying to find six receptionists they could train and employ. We didn't mind though, we had our own celebration at a restaurant and made sure to invite the staff members that we actually liked. This all happened about six months ago. Last I heard, the administration quickly realized just how lazy Marilyn was and decreased her pay in hours as a result. The newer receptionist can barely last a month before quitting due to how bad the work environment is, and they still haven't found anyone to work weekends or late nights. And remember how I mentioned that Marilyn would frequently do her personal work at her desk? Well, one day when I was working with her, she was filling out forms to get her kids free lunches at school. Also, it turns out that she lied on those forms, stating that her husband was the only one in the family that worked to ensure that they were under the amount of money needed to be eligible for the program. It just so happens that the vice principal of her school received a call from someone to let them know that Marilyn was lying about being unemployed and had no qualms giving out Marilyn's work address and hours. I know for a fact that her kids were kicked off this list, given that the vice principal called me back and confirmed it. Man, it just blows my mind how stupid business owners are when it comes to finances. Okay, so they lost $50,000 from missed appointments. Let's just like shave that in half down to 25k. All they had to do was take the 25k, divide it by 5 because 5 people quit, and offer each of those 5 people $5,000 to quit like one month later. If you were quitting and your boss was like, hey, we really need you. If you stick around for another month, we'll pay you an extra $5,000. Would you take that offer? Because a lot of people would. And like, yeah, they may not keep all five people, but certainly that would incentivize some people to stay, right? And like, yeah, it sucks to dish out 25k in bonuses to people who are quitting, but the alternative is that you lose $50,000. Our next Reddit post is from Fuddy Duddy. I used to work at the post office as a rural carrier associate. It was a part-time driver job. It paid well, and I wanted to get the full-time job which had benefits, so you have to start somewhere. The full-time driver on my route was Bill. 
Bill was his own man. He did what he wanted and the postmaster allowed it. When I was being trade, I rode one day with Bill. The next day, Bill called off work. I then had to sort his mail and drive the route all alone. It was horrible. The postmaster should have told Bill to come in, but he was a spineless man. I didn't finish until around 8 p.m. when I was supposed to get off at 3 p.m. My schedule was every Saturday and any vacation days that Bill would take. I also had to cover every time that Bill called out. Now, since this was only supposed to be a one day a week job, I also had a full time job as well at my local hospital. My post office job was at the next county over, about a 45 minute drive each way. I would get calls at 6 a.m. from Bill with some BS excuse for him not wanting to come to work. He would say that he had to go see an orthodontist today. But I worked with these doctors, and I know that there was no way that he would be able to get an appointment that early. If he needed an appointment, he should have called me the day before so I could get my other job covered. Again, the spineless postmaster would allow it to happen without any recourse. On my anniversary, I had told him I was going to take my wife out to a nice lunch before we both went to our job at the hospital. At 6am, the phone rang, and it was the same lie as always, and I had to go in. I reminded Bill that it was my anniversary, and he said, Too bad. So, I went in, totally pissed off. I got the same thing on my birthday, and then my wife's birthday. He called out, and I had to work both jobs. A few months later, nothing had changed. However, I had applied to nursing school and I was accepted for the fall program. It was still several months out, so I kept it to myself. My plan was to work the same way that I had been, and if I was offered a full-time post office job, I'd take it. If not, I'd go to nursing school. Both options were great careers. Bill called out whenever the workload was heavy, like with Sears catalogs. They were the worst. Also, the postmaster would do things like remove all the toilet paper from the bathrooms, thinking that we were wasting time pooping, I guess. He'd also turn up the heat in the summer so that we'd be miserable and leave to go drive our routes faster. Which was physically impossible because no matter how hot you got, you still had to sort everything before leaving on your route. We had to sort our mail by hand, and I was trying to be very accurate. Now, Bill had gotten remarried shortly before I started with the post office. They never had a chance for a honeymoon, so they put it off. They scheduled a two-week trip to the Caribbean. When he told me, there was a month to go before they left, which was plenty of noticed. He told me the tickets were non-refundable, so don't screw me over. I'd had enough of Bill and the postmaster screwing me over all the time, so 10 days before Bill's vacation, I put in my two weeks notice. The postmaster assumed that I would work through Bill's vacation. Nope, just the first four days. Bill called me while I was at home. Man, I've been good to you. You've got to cover my time off. This vacation is non-refundable. I reminded him of all the times that he lied to force me to cover his shifts, and the days that I had to work for him, like my anniversary, my birthday, my wife's birthday, etc. Also, he had screwed me over in orientation, making my first several weeks miserable. I left the day I said I would, the Prime Minister refused to cover, and Bill had to cancel the trip and come in and work. Also, I loved nursing, so I made the better choice. That was r slash pro revenge, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.